Well, today I want to speak to you on this thought, how to be a Great Commission Christian. Now, I'll get to that in a moment. For just a few minutes, I want to talk about vision a little bit, talk about what God's doing in our church. I, in an email that was sent out this week, I told you that I'm going to give you an update on where we are on purchasing this building on the closing. Uh, let me, uh, for those of you maybe that are newer, let me kind of give you a brief overview. Uh, you know, coming up into uh, COVID-19 in 2020, uh, that rocked the world. It rocked everything, people's jobs, the educational system, and it particularly rocked churches. Um, it has been, studies have shown that uh, of people that attended church regularly, faithfully, before COVID-19, that fewer than 50% of those people go to church regularly now. So there are a lot of people that dropped out. Well, that began a, a chain of events, and we all experienced that, came through that uh, together. And so over uh, that period of time, uh, it began to be more and more expensive to be able to be in the building that we were in, which we leased, we did not own. And so we started a building campaign, as you know, and we raised money to have a down payment on a building. And the bank told us at the time that we needed about $150,000 for a down payment and that uh, we were going to be purchasing uh, the building that is at uh, Eagles Brook Country Club there, and that was the plan. Well, of course, you know that things began to change. Banks began to say, well, we're probably not going to be loaning to churches. And so we continued to raise money. We moved uh, to Strong Rock Christian School. Well, this last November, uh, God opened an opportunity for us to get into this building. And uh, so we made the move quickly. And uh, the gracious hosts, the people that own this building, uh, said that we can close and we began to work toward that. Well, we began immediately to work with banks. And uh, like, as you, I'm sure you're probably aware, uh, whenever there are changes in culture or maybe things don't seem to be quite as stable as they were before, well, the banking industry gets much more selective, shall we say. And so we were told <clears throat> uh, that uh, no problem, we'd been pre-qualified, we were going to be able to get the building, the, the loan for this building, no problem whatsoever. Well, when it got close, they changed their mind. This bank said, uh, well, we're not going to be loaning. And so we went through a series of banks, dealing with them, and it just changed. Things, they said, yes, it looks good. And then when it came time to get ready to close, things would change. We went from needing $150,000 uh, to one bank said, you need $750,000 to bring to the table to close. Well, as you can imagine, that causes a lot of frustration. Uh, but I'm glad to report that we have been approved uh, for getting a loan, and our elders uh, have looked at this, and here's what we're doing, okay, so I want to be totally upfront and transparent so you know what's going on. Uh, the, the, the loan that we have uh, been approved for, um, we've got a certain amount of time to close, but we are looking for a better interest rate, okay? So that's where we are. Uh, we can close soon, uh, uh, making sure, though, that we are doing everything in our power to get the rate that we want, the amount, and so forth. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so uh, this is what our elders said. We discussed this recently, <clears throat> that this is a great backup plan. All right, if we cannot, and, and we're working with a couple of other banks, so I want you to know that, yes, they've said yes, uh, we are able to move forward. However, uh, the rate that we're, we've been approved for and that with this particular bank is not as good as we would like, and so we're looking uh, to maybe close with another bank, all right? In the meantime, we're good with the sellers, the, the ones that own this building. Uh, we're continuing to pay monthly. They're fine. We're on that course, okay? So just wanted you to know this is where we are. Uh, we are, um, the good news is, um, a year ago, a year ago, the amount of money we had in the bank compared to now, we have over $100,000 more in the bank today than we did a year ago. 
And so God is meeting our needs, and so we're just continuing uh, to move forward with this. I'll tell you what I'd like, and this is maybe something you can pray about. You know what I think would be great is if we, if God provided the money for us, that we didn't even have to borrow any money from a bank. That'd be awesome, wouldn't it? Okay? But here, here's the thing. Pray. Pray. God's not broke. Uh, God has no problem. God's not worried about interest rates. God's not worried about the banking system. Uh, but we just want to be good stewards and uh, get as good a deal as we possibly can and then pay off this building as quickly as we possibly can and then build a new auditorium. All right, that's, that's our plan. That's what we're planning on doing. And so uh, we just leave that up, up to the Lord as the timing. And so if you have further questions, you can see me after the service and I'll be glad to talk with you further, okay? Well, today, as I said, I'm going to talk to you about how to be a great commission Christian. Now, you may not be familiar with that term. What is the great commission? Well, there are two great commandments that Jesus gave in the New Testament. He said the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So it's this uh, vertical and horizontal relationship, relationship with God, relationship with mankind. So we are uh, to fulfill the great commandment. So what is the great commission? That is the mission that Jesus gave us to fulfill here on this earth. And so God has called us to spread the gospel. What does the word gospel mean? It means good news. It's the good news about Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul defined it for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 when he wrote in this, in this letter to the Corinthian church, he wrote the oldest, what we believe is the oldest Christian creed in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, scholars believe that uh, within a couple of months after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, this creed was written down and uh, Christians and churches began to quote this creed and it was the gospel. And here's what Paul wrote. He said that he delivered to us that which he also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture, that he was buried and he rose again the third day, according to the scripture. And it goes on to tell who he, who he appeared to and revealed himself to. So uh, in essence, the gospel is that Christ died, that he was buried, and that he rose from the grave. That's, in a nutshell, the gospel. It means good news. Now, why is it good news? Because According to Scripture, according to God's Word, you and I cannot be good enough to earn our way to heaven. Now, human nature thinks by our own nature that we're pretty good. In fact, I've learned this, that we typically greatly overestimate our goodness and underestimate our sin. You ever notice that to be true about yourself? I've certainly noticed it to be true <clears throat> about me. And then... When it comes to other people's sin, we are quick to recognize that in them. Oh, we can point out their faults very quickly, whereas by our own sinful nature, we do not like to have our own faults pointed out to us. But here is, in essence, the necessary, the need of the gospel, because you can't be good enough. The Bible tells us that all have sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. What is God's glorious standard? It's perfection. So unless you can say, I am perfect, I've never sinned, I've never even had a bad thought, I've never told a lie, I've never done anything to anyone at any time in my life that could even remotely be considered sinful. Well, anybody that thinks that, you need to see a psychiatrist, okay? Because we all have sinned, and we know that. We if we're honest with ourselves, we know that we have sinned. Now, here's the question. How much sin makes you imperfect? Just one, okay? I mean, if the standard is perfection, then telling one lie, having a bad attitude one day, being dishonest one time, that's all it takes until you're no longer perfect. So, what was the point of the gospel? God knew 
that we could not earn heaven with our own goodness because we can't be good enough. Why? Because we're not perfect. The Bible says we're all born sinners. In other words, we inherited a sin nature from Adam. Have you ever wondered why you don't have to teach a child how to tell a lie? They know that automatically. Anybody ever, when your kid was three years old, say, okay, we're going to have some selfish lessons today. We're going to learn how to be selfish. Nobody ever had to do that. Why? Because it comes naturally. Why? Because your child is the worst kid born in the history of the world? No. Because in our sinful nature, we inherit that from Adam. The Bible tells us that from Adam, we have inherited death. In other words, spiritual death, and we physically all will die one day. And so the Bible says, uh, wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. So why is the gospel good news? Because the good news is, you can't, but Jesus can. You can't be good enough, but Jesus will give you, based on his goodness, the righteousness that's necessary for you to go to heaven. Are you perfect? No. Have you sinned? Absolutely. But when you turn to Jesus, this is the gospel, and you depend on his death, his burial, and his resurrection, you put your faith in his works, not yours, that is called good news. You see, you don't have to be perfect because Jesus was. You don't have to be uh, good enough because Jesus is good enough. And what the Bible shows us in the gospel is this, that because you cannot be good enough. By the way, did you know that uh, in the Beatitudes, uh, the beginning of the most famous sermon ever preached, the greatest sermon ever preached in the history of the world was by Jesus, it's the Sermon on the Mount, and the beginning of that message, here's what it says, the very first line of the message that's recorded for us, here's what it says, blessed, that's a, a plural word, it's happy, happy, doubly blessed, blessed in this life and in the life to come, blessed is the man, or the mankind, or the person, the man or the woman, blessed is the man uh, that uh, blessed are those that are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does the word poor in spirit mean? What does that phrase mean? It means that you recognize that you are utterly helpless to help yourself. The, the idea of being poor in spirit, in the words of Jesus, didn't mean poor like, hey, I need to borrow five bucks to get lunch. Not that. Not poor as in, boy, I sure can't afford that super nice pair of shoes that I would like. No, not that. Not poor as in, boy, I don't have enough money to make my rent this month. No, that's not the kind of poor. That word was a word that was used to describe a person that was completely hopeless. They were abject with no hope, with no prospects, and normally it was used of a person because they didn't have a, a welfare system in that culture like we do today. A person that had no job, they had no ability, they had, physically they were broken, physically they were incapable of work, and the only hope they had was to be a beggar for someone else to provide for them. Now get the picture, okay, and I'm going somewhere with this, okay? The picture is that the good news of the gospel is that when you recognize that your goodness is not enough, that you fail at even the remotest chance of being perfect. When you need someone to work on your behalf, can you earn your way to heaven? Absolutely not. Why? Because you can't be good enough. You're not perfect, okay? Because it doesn't matter if you're better than your neighbor. It doesn't matter if you're better than average. The point is that you fall short of God's standard. You fall short of being like Jesus. That's the point. But the good news is, that when you're poor in spirit, that is, I admit that I must have help, that without someone intervening on my behalf, I have no hope, I have no help. Jesus said, blessed are those people that recognize that you need God. Why? He said, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So, what does it mean about the Great Commission? Well, like I said, this idea was that Jesus came to earth for a purpose. 
He came to earth to fulfill the gospel. That gospel being that Christ died, that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day in order to purchase our salvation. In other words, he paid the penalty for our sin. We were not just, but he is, and he justifies us through his righteousness. And the point is this, that when you get the good news, you realize that it is beyond good. It is the greatest news ever. It is the greatest news that you could ever possibly receive. The news that God loves you, that Christ died in your place, that Christ paid the penalty for your sins, and all you must do is turn to him in faith and trust in his finished work, and he does all the heavy lifting. He does everything that is necessary to bring you into a right relationship with God. That's called being justified. That's called being declared righteous in the eyes of God. That means that God, when he sees you, when you put your faith in Jesus, the gospel, the good news, when you put your faith in Jesus, when God looks at you, get this, this is important, he does not see your sin. In fact, he can't. You, do you realize that if it were not for justification, that Christ has declared you to be righteous, that you couldn't go to heaven? When you die, it's impossible. Why? Because God cannot allow sin in his presence. And so what Jesus did is he paid the penalty for our sin. That's called redemption. He paid the penalty, uh, the price for our sin, and he forgave us. And when that happened, he justifies us. And this is what justification is. He takes his righteousness. Think of it like two columns. On the one side, you got a debt column. On the other side, you got a credit column. Jesus took his credit, his righteousness, and he put it in your column so that you now have the credit of being righteous. And he took your debt, your sin, and he put it in his column. And he, the Bible tells us that he literally defeated death, sin, hell, and the grave for us. And that's how you go to heaven. That's how you're made right with God. Now, I hope I've done an adequate job of explaining what that is. Because here's the point. If that is why Christ came, and I believe it is. If the reason that Christ came was to redeem us, to save us, to bring people out of their sin to resolve the problem that began in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Remember, uh, they were created perfect. They were created uh, in the image of God. They were created without sin. But what did they do? They sinned. And what did God promise? He promised that one day there would be a Savior that would come. Remember when he gave the prophecy about the serpent and Eve, he's out put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. How many know that the woman doesn't have a seed? So what was that? That was a prophecy about Jesus Christ being born of a virgin, the Son of God. So I will put enmity between your seed and her seed. And he says, you're going to strike his heel. You're going to bruise his heel. But he is going to crush your head. That's what he promised. That's what he said that eventually that God himself would crush the head of Satan. Did he strike the heel of Jesus? Yes, Jesus died on the cross. But how many of you know that a, a heel wound is not fatal, but a crushing head wound is? And God fulfilled the promise that he made all the way back at the beginning of time for us when he died on the cross. So this is why... This is so important. This is why we call it the Great Commission. The commission being the job that God has given us to do. So keep in mind two things. The Great Commandment. God has called you to love Him with all your heart, soul, and mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Now what is the greatest way that you can fulfill that command that Jesus gave? I believe it's by keeping the Great Commission. In other words, we share the gospel. We point people to Jesus Christ. We are witnesses for him. We bring people into the family of God. 
Now, there's a couple places, two primary places in the New Testament where we get the Great Commission. I'm going to read both of them. Matthew 28, 18 to 20, it says, And then Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, Jesus was speaking to his disciples. This was after his resurrection. He says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Aren't you glad that Jesus has all authority? It's his. He has all power. He says, Go, therefore. Go, there, because I've got the power. Not because you've got it, but because he's got it. Not because you're good, but because he's good. He says, I begin all authority. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. You see, God's not just concerned with the salvation of a select few. He had the good news available to everyone. Now, does everyone receive the good news? Does everyone go to heaven when they die? No, they do not. Uh, the point is, you must receive Christ. You must put faith in Him. You must uh, follow Him, okay? Anyone that rejects, and I heard one preacher say it this way, and I like this. A person was asking, why would a righteous, loving, fair God send people to hell? And the preacher answered, he said, God doesn't send anyone to hell. You send yourself to hell by rejecting Jesus Christ. And I do believe that's true. The fact is, it's available to all. Now, does everyone get saved? No. But you have no excuse. I have no excuse. He said, all authority is given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations. And then notice what he said to do. Baptize them. You do that after salvation. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Now, uh, the point is, this is a beautiful outline, if you will, of what the church is supposed to be like, of what Christians are supposed to be like. What are we to do? We're to go. We're to share the good news. In Acts 1.8, it talks about being a witness. What is a witness? It's simply someone that tells what they saw, what they experienced. So a lot of people are intimidated when it comes to sharing the gospel. They think that you got to be Billy Graham. Maybe you need to write a book. Maybe you need a television program if you're going to be effective in sharing the gospel. Or uh, that maybe you need to stand out in the parking lot of Walmart and yell at people as they come and get in their car. I've seen people do that. I don't think that's personally effective. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the point is that is not what God has asked you to do. Now, is there anything wrong with sharing the gospel on television? No. Uh, if you get a TV show, invite me to be on it. I'll, I'll be happy to come and be a guest for you, okay? But the point is this, that sharing the good news is as simple as talking about what you've seen, what you've experienced. Now, if you haven't experienced anything, maybe that's the reason you don't have anything to talk about. But how many of you have children? Raise your hand. You got children, okay? How many have grandchildren? Raise your hand, okay? Um, now, it's true of parents, but it's particularly true of grandparents. Uh, when you have a grandchild, uh, you are not shy about sharing that news with someone else, are you? Okay? You're, in fact, kind of obnoxious at times about it. Oh, look, you know, uh, my little grandson, uh, he can count to 10 now. He should. He's 18 years old. All right? So, but you're proud of him, right? Okay? The point is this. You don't have to be coerced. You don't have to take a seminar to tell people how great your grandchild is. Why? Because you're just telling what you've experienced. You're naturally talking about it. And so here's the point about sharing the gospel, the great commission. All you got to do is tell what God's done in your life. This is what my life was like before I met Jesus, and now I have hope. This is what my life was like before I got saved, and now I, my life is better. All you got to do is just talk about what God has done for you. So he says he's with us even to the end of the age. Well, then in Mark chapter 16, uh, verses 14 to 20, this is the second primary. There are other places, but this is the second primary place uh, where uh, we see the Great Commission. Afterwards, Jesus appeared to the 11 themselves. Now, why 11? You remember there were 12, but one of them was 
Judas, right? Okay, so he was dead at this point. Okay, he had hanged himself. So he appeared to the eleven as they were reclining at the table. That's how they ate back in those days. They kind of reclined. Um, my mom would not have liked that at all. Sit up, boy. You know, put get your elbows off the table, right? Uh, but they were reclining, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those that saw him after he had risen. Remember uh, the women that saw Jesus first, and they began to talk about this, and it was just incredible. And he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. All right, you get that? Tell everyone everywhere. That's a, that's a pretty clear commission, isn't it? That's a pretty clear command. We are to tell, the only people we're to be concerned about is everyone everywhere. That's it. So he said, tell everyone, he says, uh, and whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Now I'm going to explain that. I don't believe it means that you need to be baptized to be saved. I believe this probably is referring to the baptism of the Holy Spirit that comes when a person gets saved. Uh, but I heard one preacher explain it this way. He who gets on the bus and sits down will go to town. But he who does not get on the bus will not go to town. The important part was getting on the bus, not the sitting down part, okay? And I believe that's true, though I do believe that it probably is referring to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which happens the moment you receive Christ uh, in your heart. So he says, if, you're a belie if you believe and are baptized, you'll be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. Now, don't get nervous, okay? I'm going to explain this, okay? Uh, this does not mean that you, know you know, go need to, uh, after the service, go grab a handful of rattlesnakes, okay? This is not, if you do that, good luck, all right? So that's all I'm saying. They will be able to pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. And they will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. By the way, there are instances of the disciples, these 11 that Jesus was talking to, that every one of these things they actually did. They spoke in tongues. Uh, they performed miracles. Uh, they handled snakes. Not like they were having a snake handling service, but you remember in the book of Acts when the apostle Paul, he, he was putting some firewood on, and a snake, a poisonous viper, bit him. He just kind of shook it off, and nothing happened, so he survived that. Well, there are these instances, and there are some church fathers that believe the, because there is no reference in the Bible of anyone drinking poison and surviving. So the question then is, what is Jesus talking about here? Now, could God uh, protect anyone uh, from that drank poison? Absolutely. Okay, he has that power. But there are many church fathers that believe because there was such heresy uh, right after the resurrection of Jesus, there were so many attempts to derail the gospel. Many believe that this was referring to heresy that would derail the gospel, that you could, uh, through the power of Jesus Christ and through the word of God, you could survive that, you could go through that and defeat the poison of heresy. Okay, so whether that's what it means or not, uh, maybe is up to some debate. But the point is this, uh, God performed uh, these miraculous signs in the New Testament, all except for the thing about poison, okay? So the apostles, the ones he was talking to, they, they did that. Um, so then the Lord Jesus, after he'd spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God, and they went out and preached everywhere, and I want you to notice this last phrase, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. The Lord worked with them. In other words, what you need to be a great commissioned Christian is not a theology degree, 
not a TV show, not even to be ordained. You just need to be willing to share the good news of the gospel, and the Lord will work with you. Now, here's the point. If you have family, you can let God work with you. If you have a, a spouse or a parent or a sibling or a cousin or an aunt or an uncle or a friend or a neighbor that needs the good news of Jesus Christ, God will work with you. What do you got to do? You got to be willing. You got to be willing to be what God says that you're a witness. You just simply tell what you saw. And so what, did, uh, what does it mean to be a Great Commission Christian? Well, um, I'm about to wrap this up, but let me, let me just say this. Um, when it comes to uh, fulfilling this commission, this command that Jesus gave, does it strike anybody as odd that this command was to go to everyone, everywhere? Now, how many of you can speak every language on the planet? No, you can't. How many of you have the capacity to go to all the 8 billion people on this planet and share the good news with them? Well, that's physically impossible, okay? So why would God give us a command that he didn't empower us to fulfill? Well, he did not. Because here's what I want you to see. The Great Commission can only be accomplished through teamwork. And this is the underlying thing that God wants you to see. If you're going to fulfill the Great Commission, do you have to go to every country in the world personally, become a resident of that country, learn that language, translate scripture so that the people of that country can understand it? No. But you can be a part of a team that does get somebody to go to that country. You can be a part of a church that gives and helps spread the gospel around the world through translating scripture, through supporting missionaries, through uh, starting churches. God's point is this, and the brilliance of this plan is just mind-boggling to me. Whereas you may not be able to go to everyone everywhere, you can be a part of a team, a part of a church, and together, collectively, we can go to everyone everywhere. Now, I want you to get this because this is important. When you don't do your part, when you say, well, I'm too busy, when you say, well, if I give, it's not important, they won't miss it if I don't give, they won't miss it if I don't serve, it's not a big deal if I don't participate, that's absolutely not true. Because you are a part of everyone, everywhere. God has called us to go with the good news of the gospel to everyone, everywhere. Well, let me, and I promise, it's not long, okay? I'm going to give you three points. Collect it, I mean, very, very quickly, okay? How can you be a Great Commission Christian? Number one, you can have faith. Uh, Jesus said that we're to believe and be baptized. We are to take the great commission, the good news of the gospel, to everyone everywhere. Let me tell you, you can't do it without faith. You don't get saved without faith. Uh, you don't follow Christ in baptism without faith. You don't become a part of a church without faith. You don't serve without faith. You certainly don't give without faith. And so what I can do to be a part of the great commission is that I can have faith. God will promise to bring peace in my life. He will promise to bring power in my life. That's what he did for those disciples. And uh, when, uh, when this happens, uh, Jesus promises to give us the power that we need through the Holy Spirit of God. And then he'll give you perseverance. When you have faith, listen to what he said, the last part. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them. 
You ever gotten discouraged? You ever felt like giving up? You ever feel like, I'm not going to pray for my daughter anymore. I'm not going to pray for my son anymore. I've done it for years, and they're not coming to Christ. I'm not going to pray for my dad anymore. I'm not going to pray for my grandpa anymore. I'm not going to pray for my neighbor. My neighbor is so rude. He's already told me that he doesn't want anything to do with this. And if I ever told this to him again, tried to invite him to church again, that he was going to get really, really upset with me. You ever get discouraged? Now, I want you to listen to what he said. And they went out and preached everywhere. And here's the thing. You know, the New Testament was written in Greek, Koine Greek, uh, before it was translated in English. We have a translation of it in English. And there's an interesting thing about this word everywhere. It says, well, they preached everywhere. In the Greek word, you know what that word means? Everywhere. That's what it means. They went everywhere. Everywhere. Um, when they went to the grocery store. I don't know if they had Walmart back in those days. Uh, probably not. But uh, wherever they went, when they went to the family barbecue, when they went to a wedding, when they went to work, they went everywhere. Everywhere. And the point is that the Lord worked with them. God will give you courage. He will give you perseverance. Okay? So you got to have faith. Here's the second thing. you got to obey. If this is a command from Jesus, and it is, then don't you think that we should do what he said? I mean, look, you should do anything and everything that the Bible says. All Scripture is inspired by God. But I would say that particularly important are the words that Jesus said. Wouldn't you agree? I mean... If I'm going to weigh one thing against the other, I'm going to put more emphasis on what Jesus said as being really, really, really important, okay? And here's what Jesus said to you and me. Go take this good news to everyone. What does that mean in Greek? Everyone. Everywhere. What does that mean in Greek? Everywhere. So I'm to take it to everyone, everywhere. What is my job? I'm to obey. Now, he did not say you had to write a bestseller to do this. He didn't say you had to have a podcast to do this. He didn't say you have to be on television to do this. He didn't say you had to graduate from seminary to do this. He said, everyone, everywhere, it's my job. It is something that I must obey. And then finally, I must participate. This is really where the rubber meets the road. It says, and they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them. God has issued to us a challenge. We're to take the good news, the gospel. We're to let everyone, everywhere know how good God is, how much Jesus loves them. And that is my job and that is your job. And so God has called us to be Great Commission Christians. Now, what are the two things we talked about? The Great Commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. What's the best way to fulfill that? Keep the Great Commission. The good news to everyone, everywhere. Everyone everywhere. Everyone, everywhere. You see, God will take this commandment off the board for us when everyone, everywhere has heard. Okay? Not before. Everyone, everywhere. That is why you should participate in the church. That's why you should pray for your family, for your children, for your neighbors, for the people you go to school with. That's why you should invite people to church. That's why you should serve in the local church because the church cannot function without the teamwork aspect of church. That's why you should give. That's why you should be a part of a church. You should pray 
for people to be saved. You should pray for missionaries. You should pray for people that are sharing the good news around the world. Why? Everyone, everywhere. Everyone, everywhere. Everyone, everywhere. Say it together. Everyone, everywhere. Say it together. Everyone, everywhere. Heavenly Father, thank you that you've given us this great commission, this great command, this great mission that you want us to be on. And Lord, you promised that you would be with, that you would work with us when we would obey, when we would trust, that you'll work with us, that you'd never leave us, that you'd be with us to the end of the age. And so, Lord, I pray that our church would be a great commission church, that our members would be great commissioned Christians. And God, help us to be witnesses, to invite others to receive the good news of the gospel. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Um, Next Sunday, we begin a new series, and I'm excited about this series. Um, It's called Surviving the Storms of Life, and uh, this is going to come from several places throughout scripture, Um, but I want you to be here. I want you to bring someone. Uh, This is going to be a great opportunity for us to bring people maybe that are in the middle of a storm. You know anybody that's got storms in their life? Uh, Do you know any government that seems to be in the middle of a storm? Oh, wait, yes, we live in this place, okay? You know anybody that's having a problem financially? Do you know anybody that's having a problem with their family or their marriage or their kids? Surviving the Storms of Life. You do not want to miss it. I think it's going to be incredibly powerful and effective, and I believe it'll be a blessing to you. So invite someone to come with you. Uh, today, if, you would, if you're interested in uh, what it means to be a member of this church, if you've never really done that, I'm going to go to this room at the, uh, to the right uh, and, uh, at the end of the service, and you meet me there, and I'll talk to you about what is necessary to be a member of the church, okay? If you need to receive Christ today, please come see me. I'll be happy to talk with you or come pray with one of our prayer team members and uh, we'll be glad. To, if you have a prayer request, pray with our prayer team. Um, but uh, I hope you will um, be in prayer now. We, Wednesday, we have our prayer gathering at noon. Uh, and so uh, we'll get, be getting back to, to normal. This week, school starts back in Henry County. How many parents are thrilled? You are glad to get the kids out of the house, all right? So uh, some of you are not. uh, That's okay. That means you don't have kids that live at home right now, all right? So that's all that means, okay? It doesn't mean that you're better than anyone else. It doesn't mean that you love your children more than your neighbor. It means that your kids don't live at home. That's all it means, all right? So, uh, but anyway, I hope you have a great week. I want you to know that I love you. God bless you for being here today. And we'll see you next week. Yes. Thank you. Ushers, come. Thank you. I'm glad you you, uh, mentioned that. Uh, Hey, that is great. I'm so glad that uh, you guys reminded me. Because you know what most church members would have done? They're like, whoopee, we don't have to give the offering today. So, but no, thank you for reminding me about that. And uh, so, uh, what are the ways you can give? You can obviously give in the bucket. Uh, You can give online at stillwaters.online. You can give by texting the number 84321. uh, Or you can um, give on the Church Center app, all right? And that's probably the easiest and most effective way to give. And um, so, anyway, you can be a part of that if you would like. All right, I'm just kind of stalling until we get to the last row. All right, there we go. And all right, good. Very good. Uh Uh-oh, it looks like it's raining outside, so um, you might be stuck in here for a minute. All right, God bless you. I love you. See you next week.